Fantastic. He did so well there, didn't he? Totally messed up the illustration, but there we go. You see, we're on this journey of faith. We're running this race, aren't we? And how many of you know it's pretty hard? It's tough going, isn't it? But it could be easier if only we would lose the baggage. If only we would lose the baggage. If we're going to run the race efficiently, then we need to lose the weight and the burden of sin and guilt and shame and guilt and worry and all of these things. You see, the writer to the Hebrews that Brooke read about to us just now talks about the sin that so easily entangles. Here's another image for you. Uh, anyone got ivy in their garden? I don't mean the lady. I mean ivy, the plant, you know. Well, look, it looks pretty to start with. It looks nice, doesn't it? But then it begins to wrap itself around walls and, and trees and uh, all kinds of things. And if you leave it like I left it, it's a heck of a job to try and get rid of the ivy. It begins to choke. It begins to, 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 to stop uh, the growth of other pl plants as well. And that's what sin does, doesn't it? Sin creeps up and it winds itself around us and around our lives, restricting and choking. And it might look good to start with. It might look tempting to start with, but soon it's going to catch a hold of things. What does the Word say? The Word says, throw off the things that hinder and the sin that so easily entangles. In other words, strip it away. We're on this race, but we need to lose the baggage so that we can run the race effectively. And listen, there's a whole cloud of witnesses that are cheering us on, just as we cheered on, Phil. There are those in heaven right now, those in the church right now, who are saying, come on, you can do it. And maybe if you're feeling like a bit sluggish today, maybe you're feeling like you're tripping up, maybe you've got too much baggage, we're saying to you, come on, you can do this. Lose the baggage, but you can run the race. So what's slowing you down on this journey? Is it sin? 1 John 1 verse 9 says this, that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the answer. That's the solution this morning, to come to Jesus, the one who said, I love you so much. I'll take the punishment for your sin. I'll die upon the cross for you. I'll be separated from my Father so that you don't have to be separated, so that you can live forever. Come to Jesus today. He loves you. Maybe you have faith today, and uh, there's stuff in your life that's choking you. Maybe you're not a Christian today. Maybe you have another faith today. Uh, I want to say this, that God loves every single person here in this room. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus, that whoever believes in him should not die, but have everlasting life. However, today, I want to focus more on that other line that's in that verse, the things that hinder. You see, if we would just jettison some of the things that slow us down or trip us up, uh, then our walk of faith would be easier. Jesus said to anyone who's finding the journey hard, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He wants to offer an exchange today. All the, the baggage and the weight and everything that kind of weighs you down, he wants to give you his burden, which is light. He wants to give you peace. He wants to give you joy. He wants to give you hope for the future. It's a great exchange. It's good news. We can lose the baggage. Now, look, at the end of the day, life is hard, but it's not really that hard, according to what Jesus has just said. So maybe we make it harder upon ourselves by taking on the things that we're not supposed to. What yoke are you wearing? What burden are you carrying? When we take on his yoke, it's easy and his burden is light. So here's some things that I want to share with you this morning that hinder us, that hold us back from running the race, that trip us up, that weigh us down. Here's the first thing this morning. That's better. I like that. When, when people get noisy, I preach better and I preach quicker as well. <laughs> so I promise, I'll, you know, you shout, I won't be boring and I won't be crusty, okay? Apparently, crusty. What's that? Oh, that was you, yeah. Here's the first thing. Number one, what, what hinders us? The things that only God can do. The things that only God, let's face it guys, we can't do everything. Can anybody do everything here? No, we're not God, but God can. We are just clay pots, the Bible says, earthen vessels. 
We can't do the impossible. That's God's business, not ours. We don't have to worry about that. You say, but Tim, aren't all things possible for them who believe? Yes. Isn't the sky the limit? Well, you know, let me qualify this. We need to look up in anticipation. We need to believe for the best. That's faith, isn't it? But we, we need to believe for great things. But we can't just believe for something unless God speaks first to us about it. When he speaks, his words release faith, but they also define the boundaries for the future. If we go beyond what God has said for our lives, then we move into a place of presumption. And how many of you know that that's a dangerous place? If God hasn't said it and we're just pushing it out, uh, we're in a dangerous place. Now, Jesus walked on the water and so did Peter. But probably it won't be a good idea to go and try that down the pond. Okay? Or try to walk the channel just to escape the the heavy fees of the, the ferry or anything like that. Okay? It doesn't mean that just because Jesus did and just because Peter did that we can. No, you see, Peter was acting on a word from Jesus. Peter, come to me on the water. When we respond in faith to the word that God is giving to us, then suddenly the impossible becomes possible. I wonder what that means for you in your life. Paul said this, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. In other words, when God so empowers me, to do a particular thing, then I can do it, even when it's humanly impossible to do. That's why we need to stay close to Jesus. That's why we need to hear his voice and trust that when the impossible comes along and he speaks to us about it, then we will be able to step out in faith and see it happen. Amen? Okay. Here's the second thing. Uh, But listen, if God hasn't said it, don't worry about it. You can't fix it. Okay? In your life or in other people's lives. You haven't got that control. What we need to do in that situation is humble ourselves and let him sort it out and just stand in awe of his greatness and his power. So today, if there are things that you are taking on that are not your responsibility, when it actually belongs to God, then throw it off because it's weighing you down. It's consuming your energy. It's consuming your thoughts. Here's the second thing. The things that have happened in the past, that's another thing that hinders us, the things that have happened in the past. And I'm talking today specifically about past failures, but not just past failures, past successes as well. Both can be a hindrance. You see, firstly, too many people in life are locked into their failures, which trip them up and entangle them. They're constantly looking back and allowing that situation where they failed to hold them up and say, what's the point? I'm not going to try again. You see, unless we throw it off, failure can give birth to disillusionment and stop us from trying again. We can't change the past. So throw it off. It's a new day. It's a new day. Lose the baggage. Rather, we need to fail forward and use our failures as stepping stones to success. Paul said this in Philippians chapter 3, verse 12, I've not yet arrived. But forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize. He's not looking back. He's looking forward. Church, we need to look forward into the purposes and promises of God and not be constantly held back by the things of the past. Secondly, success will also hold us back. Did you know that? Success hold us back? Why? Surely that would spur us on. Actually, We need to celebrate success along the way. But if we stay there, we die. And we run the risk of not achieving all that God has planned for us to do. Jesus, it says, went through all the towns and villages, preaching the good news of the kingdom, healing the sick, casting out demons, and all of those things. You see, he kept on going. He kept moving. He didn't stay for the party in a particular village. No, he moved on to the next one. we got to keep moving through the times of success that God will give at the breakthroughs. Yes, thank you, God. But what's next? Jurgen Klopp, Liverpool manager, it'd be the easiest thing for him to do to stay and enjoy the success of Liverpool. Um, Not just saying, but you've got to give it to him. But uh, what a great manager. Uh, It would be the easiest thing to do to stay there and to see more success and uh, win some more silverware and all the rest of it, but actually he knows that it's time to finish. 
once he, he said this, that, you know, it's not about winning. It's not about the football. It's not about the team. He said, my life and my identity is all in Jesus Christ. That's where my success is. That's where my significance is found. Now, look, if failure is the parent of disillusionment, then success has the potential to be the parent of complacency. And the danger is that we settle down basking in our victories, but lowering our goals of expectation. It's time to shake off failure, but it's time to shake off past success as well. We celebrate it, but now there's something more. It's limiting our future if we don't. If you're still partying around your last achievement, then it's time to move into what's next. Okay, so we're moving on to the third thing. I'm going to go quite quickly today. It's number one, the things that only God can do. Number two, the things that have happened in the past. Number three, the things that tomorrow holds. The things that tomorrow holds. Uh, on the ends of your rows under the seat, there's some post-it notes. And maybe you just take that post-it note if you're on the end of a seat and uh, just peel one off and then just pass it along. And hopefully you've got a pen or, or something like that. Uh, maybe some of the stewards, the team can just help us if there's some more pens that are necessary. But just as I'm talking, maybe there's some stuff that you're concerned about tomorrow or in this week, the things that tomorrow holds. I want to tell you that those things hinder us. Those things stop us right now in the present, enjoying the blessing of God, enjoying his peace for today. We, we trade it in because we're so worried about tomorrow. I wonder what that thing is for you. Matthew 6, 34 says this, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. There may be trouble ahead. There probably is. There probably will be. That's life, isn't it? Life is hard. There will be some trouble. We expect it, but look, we're not going to get pulled down by it. We're not going to get overwhelmed by it. We're not going to get worried and knocked off course by it because we trust in God. We trust that God is faithful and he is is our Father. We, what we need is a confidence in the sovereignty of God. Psalm 139, 16 says this, all the days of my life were numbered before one of them came to be. Isn't it lovely to know that little Seth, you know, when he was in his mother's womb, God knit him together. God made him. Little Leo over here, God made these precious kids, made each one of us. And before we were born, all the days of our lives were numbered before one of them came to be. And there would be good days and there would be bad days. And why have we dedicated little Seth today? Because we're saying, God, would you watch over this precious little boy? Would you look after him? Would you go before him? Would you prepare the way? Would you draw him to you so he can know your grace, know your faithfulness and your strength and power each day? That's why we're saying as a church, we're behind that family. We're praying for Seth. We're praying for Leo and all these other precious uh, children as well in the life of our church. But too often, we get worried about tomorrow. We, we, we kind of uh, uh, spend more time thinking about tomorrow than enjoying the day. I want to say, throw off this unnecessary thing of worry. Jesus said, the birds of the air are important. I see the sparrow fall. He said, God sees, you know, uh, what they need. He sees that they need a nest. He sees that they need food. And he supplies it for, but then he says, how much more valuable are you than they? How much more valuable? Maybe you don't feel of value. Maybe you don't feel, you know, very worthy. Maybe you feel like you've been rejected and nobody cares. God looks at you today and he says, you're more value. You've got so much worth. So much so that he came and he took your place and died and took the punishment for you. Let's stay close to Jesus and know his wisdom and his grace and his provision and his protection. And it will all come at the right time as we stay close to him. Okay, so hand over your worries to God. However, sometimes we do that. But when we do that, 
too often we take it back again. That's number four, the things that we give to God. So right now you're writing down what tomorrow holds and the fears that you've got and the doubts that you may have and the worries and the anxieties and the concerns. But then what we often do is that, you know, we give it to God and we say, God, take this, but then we don't trust God. We say, God, I think you need a little bit of help, so I'm going to just take it back and worry about it through the night. I'm going to stay awake again and just worry and worry. What is the point? What, what are those things that you are worrying about? Write them down. And, and look, you know, here's, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to put this. This is the, the table of doubt and fear and what tomorrow holds. And I'm going to write just a couple of things here. Uh, that difficult conversation. I've got to have this week. There's, there's one thing, okay? Um, um, oh, I've got to pay the electric bill. Yeah, there's another thing. I'm going to put that in there. And I'm uh, just a little bit worried about my grandchildren right now. Yeah, I'm just going to put that there. Do you know all of these things, whatever they may be, and there's more, they, they kind of come along, don't they? And we, we start worrying about what's, what's it going to be like? And, and we can dedicate Seth one day and we say, God, you take him. We dedicate him to you. But then, you know, we get a few months down the road and we're watching the news and we're watching about wars and we're watching about earthquakes and we begin to think, and what's it going to be like for our kids? How on earth are they going to cope? And then we begin to take it back and we begin to worry about it, begin to get concerned about what's the future going to be like for our children and our grandchildren. And, and that consumes our thinking. But actually, wasn't that one thing that we, we gave to God? One of those doubts, the fears, the things of tomorrow that, you know, right now we're being honest before God about. What are we going to do about that situation there? You see, it's a bit like who wants to be a millionaire. You've seen that game show? You know, and the person's there and the four options come up and they go for, you know, the top right one. And they think, yep, yep, got it. And then Chris Tarrant or Jeremy, what's his name, Clarkson, says, are you sure? And suddenly doubt comes in. Where you were so positive and where you knew, yeah, I know that's the answer. Just that little word, you sure? And doubt sets, oh, no, I'm not sure. Maybe I need to phone a friend. Maybe I need to, you know, ask the audience. And the devil is very good at saying, you sure? You sure that God really loves you? You sure that he cares? You sure that he can handle that? I should worry about it a little bit more. Yeah, you need to be thinking about that. Oh, There's no point going to bed tonight. Because you're going to be worrying all night. You sure, you know, church said that it would be there to support you, but really, they're just humans just like you. They'll let you down somewhere along the line. Those leaders, nice people, but they'll let you down somewhere along the line. Do you know? And doubt comes in. Do you see how the enemy does that? And then suddenly we start placing the things that we've put on the table of faith back onto the table of doubt and fear and the things that tomorrow hold. Do you know, worry is about wavering between God's word being true and God's word being false. The word says this in 1 Peter, cast all your care upon him because he cares for you. I'm going to say that again. Cast all your care upon him because he cares for you. Today, make a decision and stick to it. Stand on God's word. You know, we don't need more faith. We need less doubt. Amen? And in a few moments, we're going to respond to God in a particular way, and we're going to take things off. I've kind of represented some of your doubts and fears here today by sticking mine on the table of doubt and fear and whatever, and we're being honest before God, but in a minute, we're going to turn things around. We're going to shift things over. We're going to move from being those who are on the table of doubt to those who are in the table of faith. We're going to place those things on the table of faith. Here's number five. Other people's decisions. That's something else that hinders us. Here's a quote from somebody who said this. Don't try to change people 
Make a realistic decision about where they fit into your life based on who they are, not on who you want them to be. Anyone guilty of that? We want to try and change people's minds. We want to yeah, yeah, I can see at the back there. Uh, we want to change people's minds. We want them to fit in with our plans, don't we? But listen, we don't have that control. Why do we take on this pressure? You see, all we can do is try to influence people for good. You can't make people make decisions for the gospel or for anything else. So stop carrying that load. It's a thing that hinders And we need to throw off that baggage. You know, when it comes to uh, the gospel and salvation, even God is prohibited from doing that. Because he's given man free will. And he, he, it's down to them to make their choice. But what God does, because he's so in love with people, is that it's the kindness of God that leads people to him. To repentance, to, to turning away from a wrong life and turning to him. And, and he makes it so attractive and so appealing. Come to me. I'll give you life. Do you know? And so he influences people, but they can still say no. We can't force feed people uh, in our families or in our friendship circles or in our workplace uh, if they don't want it. But let them be attracted to the fragrance of Jesus that is in you. Love them. Pray for them. Let God's drawing power influence them. Look, you can't control the things that are outside your authority or your power or your influence, so stop trying. Here's a a little uh, example of that. Okay. This is you. This is your circle of control, okay? That's just you, just a small circle that I, you know, reflects and represents your life, your opportunity, you know, your authority, your responsibility. But look, here's, here's the, the rest of it. These are the things that are outside of your control. A lot bigger, isn't it? This is, this is, you know, other people's decisions. This is, you know, uh, the things that are going on in our country and in our world today. Uh, the things that we can do nothing about. These things are outside of our control, okay? But the trouble is we want to try and control it the best we can. But look, here's just a little intersection there. Nice little Venn diagram here for you, okay? I'm, I'm, I don't think I've even said that expression since I was at school. <laughs> Isn't that amazing, eh? There you go. Little Venn diagram. Yeah, there's the intersection there. That Just that little bit of intersection. Maybe, just maybe, you've got a little bit of influence and a little bit of possible control in that where you can try to help, you know, change a situation or bend uh, a person's will or, or, or whatever it may be or, or help them to see a better way of doing things, okay? But the trouble is so often we spend more time trying to change everything else that is going on. We can't deal with the things that are outside of our control. So we need to focus on the things that are inside our control. Do you know, that will lead to a, a far less stressful life. Okay, I can't change it. Those are the things that only God can do. So I'm going to just get on with what I can do and trust you. Here's another one, other people's races, other people's journeys. Hebrews 12, 1 says, run with perseverance the race that is marked out for you. Can I say that again? The race that is marked out for you. Can we all say that, actually? The race that is marked out for you. Now, now turn it around. The race that is marked out for me. Ready? The race that is marked out for me for me, okay? So God has marked out a race for you. Now, there's a big temptation, isn't there, to take our eyes off of our race and look at somebody else's journey. Because very often, their lane looks more glamorous. It looks uh, easier. They seem to be having an easier time. I wish I was them. Or there's greater opportunities, Or they get to do this, and and you'd love to do that. And you're constantly looking over at somebody else's lane. And if you do that and you're on a running track, you're going to trip. You're going to fall because you've got to keep your eye on your lane. You've got to know where you're going. But too often, we're looking at other people's journeys. Run the race that is marked out for you, for me. 
You see, there's a design and a pattern worked out for each of us that is exactly what we need to test us and to mature us and to make us complete. And if we look too long at other people's races, then when it's going right for them and not for us, it's easy then to get into a place of intimidation and insecurity and inadequacy. If we look too long, the pressure comes to be something that we're not capable of or called to do. Do you hear what I'm saying? We've got to run the race that is marked out for us. Church, love the life that you've been given. Play the hand that you have been dealt. Be faithful with the race that is marked out for you. I know it's tough. I know it's hard. I know it's horrible at times. But that's the race that has been marked out for you. And when God has designed that for you, he's also going to give you the strength and the ability to be able to make it through. But too often we trade that in because we want to worry about things and we want to look at the things that tomorrow holds and and we're not giving it back to God and allowing it to stay there on that table of faith. Love the life that you've been given. It demands courage. It demands a good attitude. An attitude will always determine your altitude. How far you go in life and how high will determine, is determined by how your attitude is very often. Listen, it's your destiny. It's your, you can't script it. You can't write it. You can't invent it. But you can miss out on it if we constantly are looking elsewhere. If we're looking at somebody else's lane, if we're looking at somebody else's race, if we're looking at someone else's journey. Do you know, sometimes we think that the best and the most noble purpose in life is, is going to the mission field. Uh, or we romanticize about mission to the poor or the orphan or the homeless or the prostitute or the drug addict, the celebrity. And, and when actually this nation is full of broken people, people who are hurting, people who are empty, people who don't know where to turn in all walks of life. So when Jesus asks us one day when we stand before him what we did, look, we may not be able to say all of those other things, but we might be able to say, do you know what? I worked in an office. I worked in a factory. I was punctual. I had integrity. I worked hard. I was always ready to help others, and I was ready to share my faith whenever I could. Wow. Wow good and faithful servant. I love my kids and I raised them to know and love the Lord Jesus. I was a good husband. I love my wife and I sought to be a great role model to our children and to other dads. Listen, it's not about what's given to you, but it's about what you do with what God has given. Martin Luther King said this, be faithful with the ordinary. God loves the common man. That's why he made so many. God loves the common man. That's why he made so many. So listen, when the grass looks greener, get up close and see that there are just as many weeds and brown patches in somebody else's journey of life as yours. When someone else seems to have had incredible success and breakthrough uh, and whatever uh, it is that they're doing, think about what it was like for them to get to that place. Too often we look at the destination, or, you know, where people have arrived, but we don't know the journey that it took for them to get there. And we're all on that. And there'll be breakthroughs and successes along the way, as well as the pitfalls, as well as the trips, as well as the things that hinder us. The reversals of God are not the denials of Christ. He's committed to helping us to fight the good fight and run the race and keep the faith and receive the reward. Here's the last thing I want to share with you. Is that okay? Maybe the band can just come and just join me. So uh, last thing, it's got 17 sub points. Okay. No, it hasn't really. Okay. Here's the last thing, the rejection of things that are part of the providential will of God. The, rede- the rejection of things that are part of the providential will of God. You know, sometimes we want to throw off the things that God sees as being good for us rather than embracing that which has been marked out for us, complete with all its challenges and hardships. You see, we could be running the race and still sick, and yet we still know that God is a healer. Wow, that's faith. God, I know you're a healer. I don't quite know why, you know, I've not been healed or my friend's not been healed, but I'm going to keep my eyes on you. I'm going to keep trusting you. 
when there are adverse things happening that the, the faith church people say shouldn't be happening in your life. But listen, if you've done everything that you know to do, you are in the providence of God. And the things that are often hard for us to swallow are good for us to swallow. James tells us this in chapter 1, verse 2 to 3. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Maybe we need to change our attitude. Maybe we need to embrace discipline and recognize that even the endurance that we show and the pain that it brings in some ways manifests the glory of God through sharing in his sufferings. The race is not to the swift, but to those who keep on running. Why don't you just stand with me? And I just want to read you what Brooke read to us at the beginning, Hebrews 12, but I'm going to read it from the message version. And we're going to go straight in. You can begin to play. and We're going to go straight into some worship. And then I wonder, maybe, Phil, could you just turn this table around for me? That would be great. Thank you. Maybe you've written some stuff down on a post-it note. And I'm going to ask you, in this time of response, as we come to the, the close of this service, why don't you just come? Bring that piece of paper that, I, that kind of represents your challenge, your tomorrow, your anxiety, your doubt, your fear, whatever it may be, and stick it on the table of faith today. I'm going to move my stuff that have doubts and worry. I'm going to put it onto the table of faith this morning. So listen, you could just begin to come while I even read this and we're going to go straight into a song and let's make that our response to the Lord this morning. Do you see what this means? All these pioneers who blazed the way, all these veterans cheering yeah. us on. Right. It means that we better get on with it. Strip down, start running, and never quit. Yes. No extra spiritual fat, no parasitic sins. Keep your eyes on Jesus, Woo. who both began and finished the race that we're in. Study how he did it, because he never lost sight of where he was headed. That exhilarating finish in and with God. He could put up with anything along the way, cross, shame, whatever and now he's there in the place of honor right alongside God when you find yourself flagging in your faith go over that story again and again item by item that long litany of hostility he plowed through we're on the table of faith today on the table of faith Put it on this one, okay? Hallelujah. That long litany of hostility he plowed through, and that will shoot adrenaline into your souls. Amen. Come on, let's worship. Let's respond to the Lord this morning, shall we?